Welcome, praise the Lord, to the Living Savior Church today. Good to have you, praise the Lord. <clears throat> Cheryl's got a little message she wants to tell you, and then we'll go into the teaching, praise the Lord. Yeah, like we... <clears throat> praise the Lord. I I'm going to make it, name. praise the Lord. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jesus. Frogs, get out of both of us. Go. <clears throat> You've got plenty of sleep, so I don't understand why you're growling like that. I got I'm the one that you got plenty of sleep. You went to I bed know, early, and I got five hours of sleep, and you, we both oh, have frogs going the Lord. on. <laughs> okay, but well, we did go down today to the Dallas Children's Charity downtown Dallas, uh, the Sheridan Hotel, and got 600 toys for free. And they're like very, yeah, clap. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yes, that's the most they've ever given us. <laughs> and uh, so our total now, we've raised $138,000. And we've uh, given to 11,537 children and elderly and 216 families. Okay? Wow, yes, praise, praise the, Lord. the Lord. And we're, uh, okay, so tomorrow at 5 o'clock, if you want to come, that little yellow sheet tells you where to come to Paradise Cove. Uh, we start first, we feed everybody, and then we open presents, okay? And then... What happens Tuesday? Oh, yeah, Tuesday we're out here sorting the toys and distributing all those 600 to Justin Community Closet, to Grace, to Grapevine Relief and Community Exchange, and to Salvation Army in Denton. I am not finished yet, and I still need help. At that I have a few things for Salvation Army. I have hoodies, uh, joggers, and uh, makeup and cologne to purchase for their teenagers. So I still need some help, so if you want to... Donate. Be sure you just write children or Christmas on your check or your giving off offering so that I know, you know, that it goes to that. But we're almost three, uh, to last, I think it was last Thursday, Grace started their Christmas. They go all the way to December 22nd. Justin Community Closet is having their Christmas today, and then they're going to have their toy Christmas the following Sunday because they made it special because they knew I, we were picking up today and we wouldn't have time to sort and bring to them. So they're having it next Sunday. And they're so excited because they never get new toys. They get broken toys at Justin Community Closet. And it was started because children at the Justin Elementary School did not have any clothes. And so that's why it got started. It's been there for years. And then so the last three years, we've been giving them uh, brand new toys. And again, we're going to uh, we take them about 350 of the toys because that's what they have a need for. And then whatever they don't give away, they give it to the Justin Fire Department because they have like a Toys for Tot thing and they use all of it. And then uh, Salvation Army, their Christmas is this coming Saturday. And, uh, and then, like I say, the last one to finish will be Grace on the 22nd. So God's really blessed us a lot. It's, this is our biggest year so far. And we're so proud that everyone's helped us, and and mainly we're so proud that Jesus doesn't let me down. Like he says, he said, have you ever been short? I go, no. <laughs> no, I've never been short. So he's an awesome guy, and he owns all the cattle on a thousand hills, and I'm just blessed to know him. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So thank you. Now then, I, I, didn't, <clears throat> I didn't know if uh, Cheryl was going to tell it or not, so I guess I'll have to now, since Dave made the statement he did, he's never seen Cheryl with a new pair of shoes. <laughs> well, let me tell you, as she's shopping for all these other kids' shoes, she did this year find a couple, a pair of boots. It's my Christmas. And, and so, but I want you to know that if you see her wearing one of these two beautiful boots, they didn't come out of this budget. They come out of my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> is that right, honey? Uh, okay, so I just want you to know that Dave hasn't seen her wear these new boots yet. I've seen her wear them. I know she bought them. And I've seen the checkbook, so I know. It was, uh, <laughs> yeah, and that's her Christmas. And that's what she wanted, so I bought her two different pairs of boots. And they were beautiful, and they were expensive. And a coat. And a coat, yeah. <clears throat> but, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, here, here's the thing. You know, when we, when we teach men, and I'm primarily going to deal with the men here, when we teach the men to be fathers, mm -hmm. to be husbands, to be workers, and be sons of God, we won't have this problem we have with all these kids not having any Christmas. Amen. It won't happen, you know. I mean, when, but you've got to teach the men who they are. Yeah. Men don't know who they are. 
I mean, even sons of God, you know. I mean, yesterday I dealt with a family <clears throat> that had six kids. They came here and from Houston, and they had six children, and they were raised Southern Baptists. And they were good Christian people. I mean, that husband took his wife and children to church every Sunday. They tithed, they walked, but he had never seen a miracle or a healing in his life. Never seen one. So <clears throat> somebody showed him some of the things we do on YouTube, and he went and started looking, and he started looking and looking and looking. He said, I can't believe this. This guy can't be real. It just cannot be. I've been in church all my life, and I'm, what did he say, was 30? No, he was 43. He was 43 years of age, and his wife was 39. I remember those exact dates they, when they told me. And he said, we have never seen a healing or a miracle, and I'm 43 and my wife's 39. And I thought, wow. I said, so he said, when we saw you on YouTube, he said, I'm not going to write this guy. I'm going to go see him. If he exists, I want to see him. I want to shake hands with this man. But let me tell you what. When we teach all these young men, when we teach them who they are in Christ, and they start standing on the promises of God. We'll bring God back into the schools. We'll bring God back into the church. We'll bring God back into everything. And you won't have to worry about not seeing a miracle or a healing because the God we serve, when you do what he says, he wants to bless you. Yes. And all, all of you people here know this. I'm preaching to the choir today. You know, you all know these things work and you see them work. So, wow. We, want, we, just, we just want to praise him, don't we? Yes. We just want to praise God for being the God he is. And I want to show you something and uh, just to start out today. And I want to go to Luke 137. And I want you to see what Luke 137 says in the King James Bible. Just that one little verse. For with God. <clears throat> I want you to get that in your spirit. You know, when I, when you, the, the Word of God, the power of the Word of God, you have to have it in you before it'll work. And that scripture right there, whenever I was at Cook's Medical Center years ago when my granddaughter was killed in a car wreck, when the finest doctors in the world told me, I'm sorry, sir, but she's deceased, and when we remove the tubes, the life support, she will stop breathing because she's breathing on a machine. And I said, sir... The God I serve, he'll keep her lungs pumping. He made me a promise. And I said, I'm standing on those promises, and I guarantee my God can do They said, sir, we don't want to bust your bubble, but there ain't nobody can put her brain stem back together. Nobody. I said, it's obvious you guys don't know my God. Because I had read Luke 137. What does it say? Well, we find a bunch of men... And I'm like, I'm going to be on the men today. It's our, it's our fault when we, when we as men don't believe, we don't see God do nothing. But when we believe, for with our God, what's impossible? Now, is that written? So, I mean, if it's written, can you take it to the bank? I guarantee you can take it to the bank because with God, with God, nothing is impossible. Absolutely nothing. Now let me show you why you don't see much. Let's go to Matthew 13, 58. And let's look at Matthew 13, 58, and let's look at that scripture. Let's see what that says, Matthew 13, 58. And he did not many mighty works there because of? Now when I was a good Southern Baptist, just like this couple yesterday, they were good Southern Baptists. And yesterday when I asked the question, I said, you know, you've never seen a miracle. No, never seen a healing. No. As far as I know, never talked to anybody that ever had seen one. I said, let me ask a few questions to a few people. And I said, in fact, uh, let me just, for those of you that are here today that's never seen a miracle, how many of you in this room have been healed or your prayer been answered through this ministry? Ooh, look at that. Now, folks, if you've never seen a miracle or healing, you need to get a hold of somebody who had their hand up and go talk to them after yeah. service and say, would you tell me about your miracle? And you're going to be amazed at the thing. Now, you notice there wasn't just one or two hands up, right? There was hands everywhere. So in this church, this is the kind of church, every church should be like our church. 
we should see healings and miracles, you know. I mean, we should see those. In fact, uh, Carrie wasn't here yesterday, but I told her story yesterday about and it's such a great story. I, I love telling it. But anyway, I her and her husband, they had a, a relative that was lived in Florida, and they was dying with breast cancer, and they was already sent her to hospice. And when you go to hospice, we all know what happens at hospice, right? They give you a little morphine until they kill you. You know, that's just the way it is. You know, they try to make dying as painless as possible. Whereas if we would serve God and love God and do what he says, whenever we die, we, there would be no pain anyway. We just, he'd just take us out, and, and we wouldn't have to go through all this stuff. But anyway, they're her relative, their relative, you know, they, she's sat here in this church. She's heard these promises. She's read them. She knows it's written in her Bible. So her and her husband gets on an airplane and flies to Florida to pray for a cousin or a, a relative of some kind. And they go down there, and, of course, Miss Carrie, she sits here in this church every Sunday, hears these promises written and talked about, and, and so her faith is building up. I mean, she's getting wild with faith. And so now she's going to buy an airplane ticket for her and her husband. They're going to go to Florida to pray for a relative that's dying in hospice. And they get down there, and her faith is way up here. And she gets up there, and then she looks at that relative, and she, oh, my gosh, you look awful. <laughs> And her faith goes, <laughs> and thank God for Jesus and the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost reached over her shoulder and said, Carrie, Jesus prayed for Lazarus after he'd been dead four days. And he, I raised him from the dead, so this woman's still alive, Carrie. So what did that do to your faith? It put it, you heard the bachelor, so you didn't have no problem laying hands on her then and saying, be healed in the name of Jesus. And what did the master do? And she's still home. The only person that's ever left hospice. Now, let me tell you, folks, it's a shame. It's an absolute shame that in that place, in that hospital, that that, that woman is the only woman that ever went home from hospice when we got churches everywhere and Christians everywhere we ought to have some faith women, Amen. faith men. Now, now, for a little bit, I'm going to be on the women's case here. Now, as Lee Carey, she's a woman, you know, and she went down there with her husband. He's not here. But she prayed the prayer of faith, and God raised that cousin, relative, whatever, up. And that's been how many, how many months ago now? Since the end of May. And since May. And she's out of hospice and at home and doing good. It, is God, is God looking to do miracles and healings in our lives? But he needs some unbelief. <laughs> now, why, why did the king not do any mighty works? Unbelief. You know, I mean, when I was a good, good, good Southern Baptist, I mean, I went to church every time the door was open. You know, I mean, I went to visit on Sunday afternoon after church. I had to take somebody's name or two or three names and get another deacon, and me and him would go visit people and see if they enjoyed being at the church and everything. But we never saw a miracle or healing. So why? Unbelief. In other words, if you had asked me, do you believe Jesus can raise the dead? What do you think I would have said? Oh, uh, well, no, of course, of course, Jesus of course, Jesus can, I mean, I wasn't no dummy. You know, I knew the king was the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And yes, now, do you believe Jesus can raise the dead? Oh, absolutely. Do you believe he'll raise somebody from the dead if you pray for him? I didn't know, whoa. <laughs> Wait, what if, what if somebody comes in and has a need? What if somebody simple just needs a job? What if they just need a job? Can you pray me in a job? You, you believe you, today you can, right? But not back then. <laughs> back in those days, you were just like me, huh? Right. You couldn't, unbelief, because of unbelief. Yeah. You know, when the Lord says in his word, let me, let me take you to another scripture that will confirm what I'm teaching here. You have to get rid of this unbelief. It, there we see clearly where he did not, did, he did not do my, many mighty works because of their unbelief. So if he didn't do no, nothing for them because they don't have any belief, what are, we need to get rid of that, don't we? Amen. How are we going to get rid of that? That's one place. Absolutely pray, guarantee. Pray and ask the Lord to do something to get in his word. And let's go to, uh, let's, let's move over to another place here right quick. 
Let's see where I want to go. Let me think about it for a second. And he did not many mighty works because of their unbelief. Well, so one thing for sure, we need to get rid of that unbelief. If that's why he doesn't do things, it's because we don't believe. Let's go to James 1, 6 and 7, and let's read another place there and see what happens, what, how we must believe when we pray. After you have prayed, the scripture says, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, wow, driven with the wind and is tossed. Verse 7. For let not that person think that they shall receive anything from the Lord. So if I say, I'm going to pray with you about this, and I used to be pretty good at that as a deacon, you know, when I'd been there a long time, I'd say, I will pray with you about this. But did I really ever expect something to happen? No, I really didn't, Andy. I did. Have you ever done that? A lot before. A lot before. Now you're getting where you're living on the faith side now. But you're just like me. I mean, I, I, I get tickled at this young man. Whenever he came to see me a few, I don't know, how, how, how long ago was it? Was it a couple of years ago? We got the same uh, memory, uh, about three, I think. Okay, about three years ago, he came to me, and he'd heard about us, and he came out here, and I said, what's wrong with you, son? He says, I can't sleep. I just can't sleep. I said, son, I'm going to lay hands on you, and I'm going to ask you to repent of your sins. And the scripture says, God gives his saints blessed sleep. So that's clearly written in the book of Proverbs. I said, now, do you believe it? He said, I believe it. I said, go home and get a good night's sleep. How long? You've been sleeping like a baby ever since, right? It took two to three nights of challenge, putting the medication aside, that like what you advised me to do. Yeah. But, uh, it, it was a struggle, but it was progressive. And on the third night, just like that, Done. I was taking Lanessa. Don't even think about it. Don't, uh, don't think about any prescription drugs. And don't isn't, that, isn't that amazing? <laughs> now, you all see how simple that was. What did me and him do? We used the word of God. And so we, absolutely, and we believed. That scripture says up there, but when we pray, when we, when we do this, we must believe with no doubt in our heart. Right, Andy? You got it. And you all see it took him about three nights to get his faith built up, thinking, okay, I will throw this stuff away. And when he asked me, I said, he said, what would you do with this medicine? I said, man, I'd throw that stuff away. With what I know about God's word, I'd get rid of that junk. <laughs> I, if you want to die, just go ahead and keep taking that high dollar medicine. It'll kill you. <laughs> I know, but see, the, while you were in unbelief, you still had problems sleeping. But when you finally decided, okay, Lord, your word's going to work. I'm going to get rid of this unbelief. I'm going to throw this medicine away. I'm going to take Thurman's advice, which is your advice, and then I'm going to sleep tonight with no medicine. And you lay down that night, and you slept like a log. And you've been sleeping good ever since, nearly three years now. I go to sleep before my wife does now. <laughs> <laughs> I know because she tells me she can hear me snoring. Yeah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's, let's go to Ephesians 3.20. I want to show you something in Ephesians 3.20. Go to Ephesians 3.20. We know if we live in unbelief, we don't get nothing from God, right? That's pretty clear. In other words, if we, if we stay with the Lord, now unto you, unto him that is able to do exceeding. Now, we're talking about the Lord here. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think. Just think. If you read that scripture and you say, I need a car. Or I need a job. Mike, if somebody walks up into your shop and says, Mike, I know you're a man of God. I need a job. What would you do? I would pray for them. Amen. As they were in Jesus. And they not only would get a job, but they would get an awesome job. Amen. Yeah. See, now, see, now that's where his faith's at, see. 
I mean, now it hadn't been many years ago that Mike didn't have that kind of faith. It didn't have that kind of faith, you know, but now then, I mean, him and his wife now, I mean, they walk in faith, let me tell you. I mean, and, and of course, his wife's head of him, I'll say that. <laughs> but Mike's getting there. <laughs> I'm just kidding, y'all. They both are faith people. I'm telling you, if this couple prays for you, I guarantee they believe. Mike and Gracie have had some of the most awesome testimonies that have come out of their place of business when people come down there. They had a police officer come there one time. He was ready to hang up the whole deal, and he was ready to quit everything. And Mike told him, said, get, out, get in here in my office. We're going to kick this devil out of here. We're going to pray some prayers, and we're going to get something done. And boy, when they come in there, and they did what God says, and they, he boldly prayed that prayer of faith and asked the Lord to bless that police officer, put him in the right class in school and everything else instead of laying him off, give him a better job. I mean, he went overboard and prayed. And it, everything Mike asked God to do came to pass for that man. Did it right? <laughs> that prayer of a man of faith. And like I say, when we get men that's walking holy before God, that's hidden this word in their heart like he's hid it in his heart, whenever somebody comes in that's defeated, I don't care if it's a police officer, who it is, it doesn't make no difference. It's a human being. And when you got a man of God that can pray the prayer of faith like Mike can, he can bring you in there, he can pray for you, and God moves, he gave that guy the best job, he gave him an increase in pay. I don't even know what all it gave that guy. 20 miracles. But no. It was how many miracles? 20. 20 different miracles the guy got. <laughs> all because of prayer. Amen. That power Amen. is the Word of God. And here's where it's at. And this scripture we just read, look at this. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly. In other words, he could have done 100 miracles, couldn't he, Mike? I mean, he only, he only had to pray for about 20 or 30 or whatever he said. But after he prayed, most of us can't pray in one. Mike couldn't, used to couldn't pray in one. But boy, now he don't have no problem because now he knows who this God is and he knows what God said in his word. And he's praying to this God now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I ask or think. And then that last statement says, according to the power that worketh in us. Okay, let me ask you a question. What if you don't ever read the Word? Where, what is that power? Word. It's the Word. So if you never read the Word, if you're, if you're living in the world... Or you're too busy. Mike used to, he was a good guy, but he was running a shop and he was too busy to study God's Word. So he didn't have the Word hidden in his heart. He didn't realize how important it was until he started coming here and listening to the Word being taught. And now all of a sudden, something clicked. And he said, the reason I don't have this power is because I don't have the Word in me. So I'm going to start hiding the Word in my heart. And Mike and Gracie began to hide the Word of God in their heart. And, when it, and that's just, they're just one couple out of many in this room today here that have done that. When you take that word and you hide that word in your heart, it, that power, when you've got that power where you can call forth the keys to the kingdom, you can see great things happen, can't you, Scott? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's another couple sitting right here. They've done the same thing. There's many of you in this room that have been healed or whatever. But when you learn that the keys to the kingdom is yours, that you can pray, and your heavenly Father told you you could ask him for anything, didn't he, Mike? So why would a man, why would a man come into your office and he's all upset and he's ready to kill himself almost, he's that bad, he's that depressed, he's ready to hang up everything, and most people don't have that knowledge of the kingdom hidden in their heart. So by not having that in there, you say, well, let me, let me help you. Maybe I can give you 50 bucks or $100 or something. Maybe that'll help you out. That's not what's going to solve his problem. You may solve the problem for a few minutes. He may be able to go buy something he needed or a hamburger or something if he's hungry and hadn't had nothing to eat. But you, it's okay to give him some money but you want to make sure that you're teaching him the principles of the kingdom of God. So in other words, that young boy, he, you don't want to just give him a fish. 
you want to teach him how to go out there and throw that line in and catch a fish. And you know, if you want to go fishing, you know, you know when I used to go fishing, I hardly ever caught anything, and I had no idea the keys to the kingdom and how they work. Somebody said, you want fishing? Yeah. I said, what do you expect to catch? I said, well, usually probably nothing. You see anything wrong with that already? Oh, yeah. <laughs> see, y'all all picked up on that right off. But see, back in those days, I didn't know the keys to the kingdoms. I never had any idea. I had to say, yeah, I'm going fishing today. I guarantee it, I'm going to catch the big one. I'm going to catch that big boy today. I mean, he's, the Lord's going to put him on my line. That fish, that fish and me, God, I'm out here fishing, and I'm going to, I'm going to catch that fish. Or just like I, I told some of y'all, didn't tell all of you, I don't think, that my son and his son were going to go deer hunting down on our place, down on the farm, here a week, a few days ago. And uh, when son Tim come by, I said, Dad, I'm going to take Preston, that's his son. We're going down to the farm. We're going to go deer hunting. This is F Preston's first deer hunt. I said, well, son, let's take one of the keys of the kingdom and let's use it so we make sure he can get a couple of deer. I said, I'm going to take Matthew 18, 19, one of the keys. Now, look at, look at this wonderful scripture, uh, Matthew 18, 19. What does it say? Matthew 18, 19? And what does it say? We can ask for what? Now, wait a minute. Surely God didn't write a book and say we could just ask for anything. Surely it wouldn't have nothing to do with a deer hunt. But what, what, does, what does anything include? It includes anything, right, Andy? So I said, Father, in Jesus' name, according to Matthew 18, 19, you said if two of us agree about anything, so I said, my son's standing here with me, and I'm going to be in agreement with him that you're going to bring a deer. So I said, they're going down to, tomorrow afternoon. So when they get there and get in the, high, the hut or whatever they do, you know, walking around wherever they're going, I said, bring them, bring Preston a little buck. I said, thank you, Lord. It's done. I said, now then they're going to go back out. I said, you're going out tomorrow, the next day? So, yeah, we're going out the second day too, Dad. And it would be that morning. We've got to come home that afternoon so we can go back. To, I can get back to work and everything. And I said, okay, Father, according to Matthew 18, 19. What did he say I could do? You, you really think Jesus really meant that? So I said, Father, in Jesus' name, according to Matthew 18, 19, one of the keys to the kingdom that you give us, I'm asking you to put my son and his son in the right place and, and bring a little deer for them to get that first day. And then the next morning when they go out, bring another beautiful uh, doe so they can get a, another one. And I said, thank you, Lord. So there's two deer they're going to get because they're going to hunt that afternoon and the next morning. Thank you, Lord. It's done. They come home the next afternoon. I, Tim, I said, well, he said, Dad, we got a little buck the first day and I got a big, nice, fat doe the second morning. <laughs> Is that what we asked for? Now, see, you, that don't happen when you come in and say, well, I hope you all get a deer. No. There ain't no faith in that. No. You got to tell the king what you want. You want that power that's working in you. And you want to use that key that he's given you, right? Yeah. Now then, if we only could hide those keys in our heart and could believe them, what's impossible with our God? No. So who's the problem then? Me and you, right? Isn't that sad? And another thing, a reason that we don't see him do a lot of these things is because we don't praise him enough. I want to confirm to you in the scripture what he said about praising him. If two of you on earth should agree as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Who would ever believe that you could go fishing and say, I'm going to catch the big one today? That big one can't get away. Somebody says, where did you learn something like that in the Scripture? I said, well, Jesus told Peter to go down to the lake and throw the line in, and the first fish he caught, there'd be, a, there'd be a coin in his mouth with enough gold to pay their taxes. Now, now did, Jesus, did Jesus say that if you believe, truly, I tell you the truth, if you believe, not only shall you do what I have been doing, but greater things than these that I've done shall you do in my name? Did he say that? Yes. So what's the problem? It's been right here. You're right. Me and you. The, we're, the, we're the culprits. The men are the culprits. 
We're not believing. We're not standing on God's word. Just like that 43-year-old young man yesterday, he said, well, my wife and I have six children. And he said, but there's a little something wrong with every one of them. Some little something here or there, whatever, you know, allergy, asthma, or whatever. Nothing major, serious, but they have problems. Yeah. I, I said, uh, let me tell you, son, I'm going to tell you what. First of all, I said, do you know what Deuteronomy 6 says? He said, I do. I said, what does it say? He said, I heard that on one of your tapes. Deuteronomy chapter 6 says, I am to teach my children the principles of the kingdom. He said, when I lie down, when I sit down, when I'm standing up, I am to teach my children about God's word. I said, that's what it says. I said, now, are you doing that? He said, no. I said, so you're disobedient to the kingdom. So I said, God ain't going to do nothing good for you. You're a disobedient son. He told you what to do for your children. I said, if you don't do it, he ain't going to bless you. I said, those kids, he put some little sickness in every one of them. Because let me tell you the way it works, son. At 43 years of age, if your children had nothing wrong with them, now you parents and all that have got kids, you will probably confirm this when I say this. If I've got children and they're all healthy and they're all well and there ain't nothing wrong with none of them and I've got plenty of money in the bank and my car is paid for and my house payments are paid up and I don't have a single need nowhere of no kind, am I looking for God? I have no needs whatsoever. I've done it all myself. You see what I mean? So am I searching for God? No, not on your life. I'm okay, Andy. I'm okay. I don't need God. I got this. You know, until, but you know, if he puts some kind of little sickness in every one of them, now then they're here looking for God to get these kids healed. If them kids had nothing wrong with they would have never come up here. They would not have drove from Houston up here. That's a four or five hour drive. Y'all know that? And then they had to drive home last night. You know, so, but if there was nothing wrong with those kids, but there's a little something wrong with each one of them. I told him, I said, son, let me tell you what. If you will start reading Deuteronomy 6, the whole chapter, read that chapter every day, and whatever God reveals to you to do, you'll do it. And then I said, if you'll start reading, after you read that a few times, if you'll start doing that with your wife and your children, just like he tells you to do, you're supposed to be a living example of Christ to your wife and your kids. So I said, you start reading that scripture to your wife, have her come in, sit down with you every night. You open the word of God, you read it. And I said, then you take those children. And every night when you pray, when you read this to your kids, you lay hands. As the father, I said, you're the spiritual head of the home. I said, as the father, you lay your hands on each one of them children. And each one of the children has got anything, whether it be allergies, asthma, or whatever, a rash, you lay hands on that child and rebuke that and command it to leave, and you quote one of these keys to the kingdom, I said, it won't be long till all of your kids will be totally well. Amen. Guarantee it. I said, I've seen God do that over and over and over. And I said, then as long as you continue to walk with him, I, it's, it's on your back, as long as you continue to walk with God and you continue to pray over your wife and your children, I said, I guarantee those kids will stay well. And you won't never have to go back to a doctor. How many years have it been since when y'all since y'all learned this, Scott? You and your wife and all your three your two boys and your daughter. How long has it been since y'all been to a doctor? Or have you forgotten? Yeah, I've forgotten. It's been, it's been a long time. Been a long time. Wow, and you used to have to go to doctors regular. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? Yep. Mm -hmm. You hide the word in your heart when the daddy takes the bull by the horns and does what he says and teaches the family about God and prays over them. I mean, if anything happens in any one of these children now, you pray over them, don't you? That's right. Yeah, both of y'all do. And that's just like the other day. I had a couple, lovely couple, and he, he's a minister in a church. I guess it's been 15 years ago, at least 15 years ago. They brought three sick boys to me. And uh, I told them when they came, I said, you know, the reason your boys are sick is because you and your husband's not getting along. And she says, are you trying to tell me that my boys are sick because of me? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, that's the craziest thing I ever heard of. I said, well, it's true. And she said, no, I don't believe that. She said, my husband's on staff at a church. I said, it don't make any difference. I said, he, he just don't understand these principles of the kingdom. You know, I mean, we, we, can be, we can be the pastor of a church and not know these things. Is that right? Absolutely. 
So I said, you know, he don't know. So I said, you know, you, if, you, if you learn these principles, you can, you can, your children can get healed. And she said, you are, you're trying to tell me that my three sons are sick because of my unforgiveness toward my husband. I said, yes. She said, you're crazy. <laughs> I mean, you're absolutely a nut. She said, I, I, just, I heard you had a healing minister, but I didn't know you was going to put me and say it's my fault. And I said, well, ma'am, it is your fault, and you're going to have to get right with your husband. I said, ma'am, the scripture clearly says the wife is to submit to the husband in all things. And she went out, and she, she said, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. And she's on, she goes out and gets in her car, and she walks out the door. She's screaming, you're the craziest pastor I've ever seen in my life. And I told her, I said, ma'am, you ask God, he'll tell you. Uh-oh. And so on the way out, she's getting her car, and she's going, and she's saying, Lord, that preacher is crazy. He's absolutely crazy. And the Lord says, Terry, he's not crazy. He knows what he's talking about. I have trained him personally. So you need to obey what he says. She said, Lord, he tells me I have to submit to my husband. He said, Terry, did I tell you in my word that you have to submit to your husband? She said, he said, did, did you see where, in my, where I said you have to submit to me? That's what he said. Submit to me. And she said, yes, Lord, and I don't have a problem submitting to you. He said, well, that means obey. And I told you also, not only do you have to submit to me, God, but you have to submit or obey your husband. And she says, God, it will be over Frank's dead body when I... And the Lord spoke to her and said, no, Terry, it'll be over your children's dead bodies. That got that mother's attention. She said, okay, Lord. So she come back. She walked in and she said, Pastor, the Lord told me you were right. And I have to submit to my husband if I want my children to get well. I said, thank you, Lord. I'm so grateful that you still talk to us. Because, see, I'm trying to tell her something that I know from God's Word, and she ain't believing it. And so this God, this God that we serve, he can do exceedingly abundantly above what? Oh, I mean, so, you know, just because you ain't never heard his voice, don't mean he don't talk to people. You know, he can do great and wonderful things. And so don't, don't ever limit God by your experiences. Because, you know, you may, you may have done some greater, greater things than these. But anyway... She went home, and she got right with her husband, and they got right with each other, and they got their marriage restored, and then they brought their children to me at, for me to pray over. And the two boys that had allergies and asthmas were instantly healed. The Lord healed both of them. But the boy that had the problem with the leg that was going to have to be uh, in a wheelchair and not, not going to be able to walk ever again, it took a few months for that leg to get completely normal. <clears throat> and when they took him back and checked him, there was absolutely nothing wrong with his leg. So anyway, they were here just a few Sundays ago, and it's been 10 or 15 years since this happened. And I asked Terry and Frank, as they sat here, I said, uh, I know y'all used to be in the doctor's office once or twice every week or two. Was that true? She, oh, yeah. We were hardly ever went more than a week without being in the doctor's office with at least one of the boys. I said, and after y'all got right with each other and with God, and we prayed for your boys, I said, how many times? How long has that been? She said, 12 years. I said, okay, so, and how many times have you all been to the doctor in the last 12 years? She said, zero, not one single time. <clears throat> if you obey me and do what I say, I will take all sickness away from you and your children. Did, did he really mean that? Now, if you do not, if you do not obey me, you do not do what I say, I will curse you and your children. I don't like that, do you? So I, I'd much rather obey. And one of the things I want to do, I'm going to start Psalm 146. I want to go to Psalm 146. I want to look, at, see a little bit here. Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Hmm. Okay, let's go on down a little further in that psalm. What does he say? While I live, will I praise the Lord. Are, are you beginning to get the idea already he likes praise? Yeah. Well, then if, we, if he likes praise, why don't we do more of it? In other words, why do we not have, I mean, you can, sometimes you can go to a church and you can sit in the whole service all the way through and never hear anybody say praise the Lord. Yeah, I mean, is it true? Sure you can. You can go there and nobody praises the Lord. 
But do you ask them how many miracles happened there? And probably the answer is zero. zero. If they praise the Lord, I mean, if you praise him and worship him, he's going to make things happen in your place. Is that right, Mike? If you're not ashamed of him and you're praising him, and I, I have no idea, and Mike probably couldn't ever put a pencil to it either, but after he took that hour or two or whatever it was and prayed for that police officer that day and they did all the things they did, there ain't no telling how and how much God blessed that ministry, Mike and Gracie's ministry over there with jobs and work and everything. Ain't no telling. You probably could never put a pencil together, you know, to, to, to get a result of, back of how God blessed you for taking time to bless that man with the knowledge you had from the Word of God. But it, it, really, it really blessed you to see everything you prayed for happen, didn't it, Mike? Yes, sir. I mean, it would me, I guarantee you. But while I live, while I praise the Lord, I will have to say that police officer was praising the Lord, wasn't he? Amen. When he come back in, he was praising the Lord. Wasn't long, you and Gracie was praising the Lord. I will sing praises unto him, to my God, while I have any being in me. While I have my being, I will praise him. What's he trying to tell us? Praise. When you leave this place today, as you're driving away, or when the service is over, it wouldn't hurt anything if you just said, Lord, I praise you. I thank you. You know, I mean, some of y'all heard me tell the story about Cheryl's tooth. You know, I prayed for Cheryl. I mean, she had a tooth, come, a bridge come loose on her, in her mouth and on one end, and the, she went to the dentist to have it taken off and re-glued, and the dentist couldn't get it off. He hammered on it, he beat on it, and everything. Of course, Cheryl done something that most women would never do. She said, after he beat on that a little while, she said, uh, Dennis, there, sir, would you stop a minute and let me call my husband? I want him to pray that this will come off. Now, when's the last time you had somebody do that? <laughs> no, people don't do that. In the doctor's office, let me pray. Let me call my husband and let him pray. She knows that I'm her spiritual head, and if she wants a prayer answered, she needs to get in touch with me. She knows that. And so she called, and I prayed. And I thanked the Lord. I did thank him, but nothing happened. She called me back in 10 minutes and said, Honey, you're going to pray again. It didn't work. I said, What? I was surprised. I fully expected it to work. God always answers my prayer for my wife, always. But anyway, I prayed again, and I thanked him again. And then I didn't hear nothing else from her, so I just assumed, you know, that the thing came off, and he got it glued, and everything's great. Well, when she got home, I said, well, how, how's the dentist deal turn out? She said, he couldn't get it off. I said, what? I prayed two times. I mean, that's the way we should think, ladies and gentlemen. If you pray twice, what did I do wrong? Because the promises of God and the promises of the kingdom, he says, you can ask for anything and I will do it. And all my promises are yes and amen. Yes and amen. What scripture is that? Where's that found? 1 Corinthians 1.20 really says that? It sure does. How many of you all know 1 Corinthians 1.20 really says what she just said? How many of you know that? Put it on the board. Let's just see if she's right. That, that couldn't be right. God would never say nothing like that. Let's just see what he said up there. <laughs> Second Corinthians. Oh, okay. See, there we go. Second Corinthians one twenty. And it was for all the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him, Amen, unto the glory of God by us. Second Corinthians one twenty literally says that every promise God made is, is, is yours. Is that true? So anyway, back to the tooth. I did thank him and I did praise him a little bit for taking that thing off, but it didn't come off. And so when she got home, I said, how's the tooth? And she said, honey, it didn't come off. They're going to have to get a special puller to pull it off next week. A special tool. A special tool. And I said, well, okay. So me and Eldon went somewhere, and while we were down there, I'm meditating on, I wonder what I did wrong that my prayer didn't work for my wife. Because you men, us men, we're the spiritual head of our house, and Mike, when we pray for our mate or anybody else in our house, what should happen? It got to happen. It's the key to the kingdom. If we didn't, if it don't happen, there's something wrong with me or you, right? Yes, There's something wrong. We got to find out what this is. 
So I said, Lord, I don't understand this. And Eldon said, Thurman, why did God not answer your prayer? He said, I've seen you pray for Cheryl many times. And every time you pray for her, God answers your prayer almost instantly. She said, what? He said, what's the problem? I said, Eldon, I don't know. I was just sitting here meditating on that myself. And I said, you know, I'm hearing something in the background that's so, so light. And he said, what are you hearing? I said, praise. That's it. I didn't praise him enough. In Psalm 146, four or five times he said, praise me, did he not? Yes, Do you think he likes praise? Yes, he loves praise. So I said, Elder said, that's got to be it, Thurman. That's it. I said, Father, I just threw both hands up in there. I said, Lord, I want to praise you. I want to praise you. I want to thank you, Lord. I want to just thank you for taking that bridge off of Cheryl's mouth. Lord, I just praise you. And Eldon threw his hands up put his knee against the steering wheel and said, Lord, me and Thurman want to praise you for taking that bridge off of Cheryl's mouth. Thank you, Lord. Me and him, too, the craziest men you've ever seen in your life, driving down the road with our hands up, praising God. Yeah. Out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And all of a sudden, for, we did this for 10 minutes or so or something like this, and my cell phone rang, and it was my wife, and I said, well, the Cheryl's called me. Let me see what it is. And I grabbed my phone out, and I pulled it out, and I said, yes, honey. She said, what in the world are you doing? I said, me and Eldon's praising the Lord for taking your bridge off your teeth. She said, I knew it. She said, the thing just fell off in my mouth. <laughs> true story. That's a true story. It happened, did it not, honey, just like that? Now then, why? We, did, we couldn't get an answer to prayer because of why? No praise. No praise. Who do you think I am? I love praise. praise. You know, if you girls want to see your husband do great things, praise him once in a while. He's made in the image of God. But you know, if you girls, y'all, husbands, if you hadn't figured it out yet, your girl likes to be praised too. When she does something, tell her how nice she is. Just like Cheryl. I tell Cheryl every day, sometimes more than once a day, how beautiful she is and how I love her. I tell her. She loved it. You know, how many of you girls in here like to be told you're beautiful? Not, no hands. I can't believe this. <laughs> You girls need to, I mean, whenever I ask you a question like that, your hand ought to go up right like that. I love to be told I'm beautiful. Ain't nothing wrong with being beautiful. Amen. Just remember, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Amen. You know, so, and God made every, every one of you, so he wants every one of you to be beautiful. And the same way with men. God made us all, and he made us perfect in his image and his likeness, and he thinks you're handsome. Yeah. Now, there's some girl out there, some woman somewhere that thinks you're handsome too. Especially if she's married to you, you know, that's the way every woman should think her husband is the most handsome man on the block. Absolutely. You know, and somebody else might say, him? I don't think he's handsome at all. I said, I don't have to, I'm not trying to fool you. I'm only trying to please my wife. <laughs> she thinks I'm handsome, so that's all I care about. So if, we, if she thinks I'm handsome, she don't have no problem. And I say, honey, let's go to dinner. She has no problem going to dinner with me. <laughs> you see what I mean? She loves to be told she's beautiful. And I think all you girls that didn't hold up your hand, I think you're just lying. <laughs> I think you like to be told you're beautiful and everything too. So, but the Lord says there, he, we need to praise him. Does he not? For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him, amen. 2 Corinthians 1, 20, to the glory of God by us, by us, by us. We do this. It's, everything is by us on the kingdom. Wow. Okay, let's go back to Psalm 146. Psalm 146. <laughs> Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Go ahead. While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have my being. Verse 3. But not your trust, put not your trust in princesses, but in the Son of Man. Now, wait a minute. How many people do you know that puts their trust in man? I mean, the terrible thing about it is the first thing happens when one of us gets sick or we have a pain in our side or our back or anywhere else 
what do we do? We go to the we go to the medicine cabinet usually first. <laughs> no more. But that's what we used to do at Miss Jackie. We go to the medicine cabinet. I know I used to do that. We used to have a medicine cabinet. I don't have a medicine cabinet in my house. <laughs> it's non-existent. I don't use such a critter. I believe in God. If I need prayer for something, if I get a pain in my back or side or whatever, I know where the woman is that can pray the prayer of faith that pray that off of me. And she's right here, sitting right here in the front row. But I know lots of you guys and girls that can pray that off of me if something happens. So I don't have, I, I, you know, I got doctors all over the place. And, and the beautiful part about y'all, y'all don't leave no scars when you get through working with surgery. Everything's working, and everything's working good. And then the price you charge me is out of this world. Right. Nothing. Is, is that the way the king, see, the king wants to be our healer. He wants to be our healer, but we got to do it his way. We got to praise him. We got to worship him. We got to thank him. And if we praise him and worship him, and then you pray. In fact, I was just telling one of the ladies on the back row that I prayed for a while ago. She had a little problem there in her neck, and I prayed for her. I told her, I said, you know, I, Cheryl and I was in Norway a few years ago, and a little lady like her, except her hand was all shriveled. I said, whenever I was going around the room shaking hands with everybody, getting ready to speak at the seminary, I said, I walked up to this lady, and she's got her hand all shriveled up like this. And when I saw it, I just put my hands around that and said, ma'am, may the Lord bless you. That's all I said. And the Lord instantly made that woman's hand perfectly normal in my hand just like that. <laughs> See, God wants to do good things for his children. But he needs a man, a man that believes him. We don't need an unbelief man. We got too many of them. We need some men that will walk in integrity with God's word. Men that know they're sons of God, that know who they are in Christ, and know when, if their wife or their children has a problem, that mother is looking for daddy. One of the children just got hurt. Come home and pray. And either that or he'll say, I'm too busy. I can't come home. I'll just pray over the phone. God will hear my prayer over the phone. Yeah. Have you ever had an answer to prayer over the phone? Oh, yeah. oh my goodness. Like, like Dave said there a while ago, Cheryl and I, we set up every night, almost every night, and we pray for people. People call in via e email. And we answer their emails till midnight, for one, two, and we have been up as late as four in the morning, praying over people. And then what I love when we, so, you know, you think, God, is God really hearing these things? I mean, this lady here is comatose. She's got cancer and on and on and on. And we pray, and it's three o'clock in the morning. And I think, the devil's over there saying, you know, this ain't worth it. That ain't, you know, you could be sleeping. <laughs> this ain't going to work. Y'all know this critter? You've heard of him, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so you think, no, no. I mean, I have, I have the keys to the kingdom. That scripture clearly says if two of us, me and Charles too, and if we agree about anything, it is done. It can't fail. So we remit the person's sins and pray the prayer of faith for them. And then one to three to five days later, or whatever, the reports that what we prayed for that night start coming in. One, one of them wrote back the next day and said, you don't understand why you, Thurman, you don't understand when you say have this woman remit her sins or forgive her sins. This woman's comatose because she's had a stroke and she can't do nothing. I said, okay, no problem, honey. Me and you will pray the prayer of faith. We'll remit her sins. We'll pray the prayer of faith. And thank you, Lord. It's done. She's recovering and everything's great. Next day, next day, next day, the lady called back and said, man, whatever you did, she's setting up and eating and everything's going great. <laughs> Does the Word of God work? Yes. And then somebody say, how about these miracles? I say, which miracle? I got so many miracles and so many answers to prayer. If I was to ask, if I was, I bet you, Carrie, I bet you if I asked you how many miracles you've seen in the last two years, you couldn't tell me. Isn't that a bad thing to have? That's terrible to have so many answers to prayer. You can't remember all of them. Miss Jackie, you're the same way. You know, you girls pray for people and things, all, and you're always telling me about the things God done in your life. <laughs> Isn't he awesome? What are we missing? Maybe we're not praising him enough. 
Let's go down another scripture, another verse. Put your promise in the Lord. This breath goes forth. Verse, let's go to the, let's verse 5. Let's go down to another one and see if we can find another one that has. <clears throat> Next verse. He made heaven and earth and the sea and all that. Wait a minute now. If you're having trouble with faith, believing, I'm, I'm going to be like this little pastor that we were somewhere and he was teaching and, and as he was teaching he said you know I'm a pastor of a church and he said when God speaks to you and tells you to do something have you ever spoken back to him and told him he needs counsel <laughs> and I thought yes I have done that a time or two I, you have done that a oh, time or two <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. we, we know what it is to talk back to God right <laughs> so anyway he said that one day I was reading about the cosmos and I love that myself. The sun, the moon, the stars, and all the galaxies, and all the stuff is there. And he said, I used to tell God when he would tell me to do something that, you know, Lord, maybe it's not going to work perfect like that. Maybe we ought to do it like this, or we ought to add this to it. He said, I felt like I had to give God counsel. But he said, one day I was reading about this star. And he said, our sun is a big thing. You know that? A ball of fire. It's a sun out there in the middle, a star. But he said, uh, I don't think about that until I look in the scripture and I'm studying, about, actually he wasn't doing it from the scripture, but he was studying about the moon, stars, and all that stuff. And he said, I come upon this star in our galaxy that is so many times bigger than our sun. I mean, multitude, I forget how many times bigger. It was like a hundred times bigger than our sun. But it's so far out there, you and me can't even see it. But the name of this star is Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse. I remember that crazy name. He said, when I found out that God made Betelgeuse, and it was 100 times or approximately whatever, 100 times bigger than the sun, he said, I decided that God didn't need counsel for me no more. <laughs> when we finally get a hold of who he is, that's, you, you begin to get to where you can pray the prayer of faith for people, knowing that he's able... 20 things is nothing, right, Mike? Nothing. If it had been 30 or 40, it wouldn't have been nothing. He could have answered every one of them, right? Amen. But see, Mike knows that now, and he knows his God. And he, and he says, and those that know their God shall do great things. Yeah. Well, you know what? I know a bunch of men that need to know who their God is. They really need to know so they can pray the prayer of faith. And when you pray the prayer of faith and you see God answer, Wow, just like I told that 43-year-old man, that 39-year-old woman yesterday at the healing school. I said, if you'll do what I tell you, son, I guarantee these six kids you got, I guarantee if you'll start reading the Word of God to them and you'll start praying over them, you start laying hands on each one of them, and whatever the problem is with each one of them, if you will lay hands on that child and command that spirit that's causing that problem to happen in that child's body to leave and never come back and then ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit to completely restore and heal that child, I said, if you'll do that every night, I guarantee it won't be long. I said, when these kids, I said, I will guarantee you by the time these kids are 18 or less, there won't be a single flaw with any one of them. If you, as the father, will pray that prayer of faith for your kids. Because God said too many times in his word, if two of you on earth agree about anything, it shall be done. And it's. This God, the God that can do exceedingly, abundantly above all we can imagine, think, or imagine, if that's the God we're serving, then don't cut him short. Amen. Ask him for what you want. If you need a good night's sleep, you ask him. Yeah. And he gives it to you for three years, and it ain't going to stop now, is it, Andy? You didn't have to ask him but one. You have to ask him but one time. <laughs> is that awesome? Amen. It is amazing how awesome God is. But he wants us to praise him, to worship him, to thank him. <clears throat> Which made heaven and earth and the sea and all is therein. Wow, he made all that. Next verse. The sea is there. Which executes judgment to the oppressed. Which giveth food to the hungry. 
Do you ever have any idea of what it takes to feed this planet in one day? I mean, I think about us having this little deal we had last Sunday, and all y'all brought all this food, and man, I'm telling you what, that place was loaded down with food in there. I mean, when I went in there, I, me and Cheryl got to go first. I walked down that line, I thought, man, ain't no way they eat all this stuff. Oh, my Lord. But after the thing was over, I went in there, and it was cleaned out. I was dead raw. Y'all are, y'all are hungry creatures. I was, <laughs> all that food y'all brought, we eat every bit of it. There wasn't a t- couple little plates of stuff left over. I mean, it, it's God, just like, and this is just one tiny little church. Did he have any problem providing for us? No, not at all. If we'd have had 10,000 here, that would have been no problem either, would it? No. Yeah, I was listening to a guy the other day that was over, and I think it was Haiti, Haiti, and they were feeding people, and they had run out of food. And they still had a whole bunch of them that needed food, and they were hungry. So he prayed that prayer, Lord, you, you, if you give the people to eat when the, whenever you prayed over it. And then Peter and John and they all passed out food to 20,000 people, and they all ate and had 12 basketfuls left over. But Lord, we need food to feed enough food to feed all these people. He didn't say anything about basketfuls left over. He just needed enough to feed every one of them. He said whenever the day was over, we had fed everybody there and just ran out just as the last person ate. Isn't that awesome? I mean, but, I mean so what, what's impossible with our God? See, now we need some men that can pray that kind of prayer. We need some men that can stay out there just like Jesus did and say, Father, I need you to feed these people. Bless this food for all these people. Now then, if we, Jesus told us, we can do the same things he did, and that's what he said, right? Let's go to that scripture. I want you to see that scripture before we quit today. I want you to see that scripture. Uh, let's see, what scripture was I going to use there? Lord, you're going to bring that back to me now. I let that completely slip out of my... Oh, yeah, that's it. That's it, John 14, 12. That's it. Yep, John 14, 12. John, in fact, put John 14, 12 up there. Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believeth on me. Now, that's supposed to be us. We believe in Jesus. The works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now, if Jesus controlled the storm, should we be able to control the storm? If Jesus fed the multitudes of thousands, should we be able to pray over food? In other words, if Jesus controlled the fish, should we be able to speak where we want the fish to be? I never saw him use a deer in there, but I thought, hey, if it works for everything else, and he said anything. So why can't, why can't I pray for a couple of deer? And it happened. Preston got two deer, one the first afternoon, one the next morning. So isn't that awesome that God give us the kingdom and give us the keys to the kingdom? And whatever you ask in my name. I tell you what, brother, me and you need to, we need to get in the word more and know it better so we can handle these things, right? It's in the book, isn't it? And we know God can't lie to us, can he? So the problem's right here. I'm the problem. You're the problem. You need to get in that. Bill, you're the problem. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. We need to get in there and have some faith. Right? Can I say this real quick? Sure. Amen. I believe that with all my heart. Yeah, these people do here. People here do love one another. But that's how the Lord said, we'll know who my children are, by their love one for another. So if we love one another, we pray for one another, we do great things for the kingdom of God, and we see God do. We do what he told us to do. And just like this lady back there that I prayed for that had the little thing on her neck, I just told her, I said, you know, the word of God clearly says, all I got to do is just lay hands on you and he'll heal you. Is that what he said? He didn't say you have to pray. Now, if you want to pray, that's okay. 
that's just another one of the keys. You know, but one of the keys is lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And that really does work, doesn't it? Miss Carey, did you just lay hands on your relative or, or did, what, did you pray too? Lay hands and pray a short prayer. Simple little prayer. This simple Thank something. God for a miracle. Wow. And God did it. He did it. And Came she's. Out of <laughs> <laughs> ladies, we need some more ladies like this one. Amen. You all need to talk to her. <laughs> you need to get the faith Miss Carrie's got so you can, when you go out, and if you go out there, Jesus, he knew where your faith was, and he, he was there with you totally every second of the day. Because he wanted that to work for you. So that's why he spoke to you and told you. She's still alive, Carrie. It will be no problem. <laughs> I love that testimony. That's something. But I know I, I, that happened to me. The first man I raised from the dead in the name of Jesus. I mean, it was a mind-blowing thing to see God raise a man that had been dead 20 minutes when I prayed over him. And he came back to life. And within a couple of weeks, he's totally normal. And then a few weeks later, a friend of mine told me, called me and said, I've got cancer only going to live about three more months, the doctor said. So I said, well, I'm going to come see you tomorrow. I said, I'm going to get you healed. I've learned a lot of things about healing. And I said, I'm going to come down to Comanche to see you tomorrow. So I, next Monday morning after I took the day off and I got in my car and I drove down to Comanche, Texas. And when I pulled in, I, I was, there was two or three cars in the front yard. And I thought, uh oh, why is this? Maybe it's because he's sick. I went in and his wife was there and I said, how's Jack? And she said, Thurman, he died this morning about 4 o'clock. I said, I thought he said he had three months to live. She said, well, that's what the doctor said. But it didn't work. And I thought, I went in and the undertaker sitting there. And I, I sat there and he said, what are you going to do? I said, I said I'm going to raise him from the dead. <laughs> and, you know, the undertaker sitting there and he says, You're going to raise him from the dead? <laughs> oh, and I said, yes. And I guess I lost it right there. I should have said, Jesus is going to raise him from the dead. But I said, I'm going to raise him from the dead. And it did not work. I could not, I could not speak boldly, authoritatively. So I went away from there totally defeated. And I'm thinking, Lord, you let me raise one man from the dead just a few weeks ago. Now you put me in another place with another one, and I know you wanted to raise him from the dead too. And I blew it. It wasn't God's fault, was it? No, it was my lack of faith. But, you know, I can only do so much. I, you know, I just, I just couldn't have the faith for it. I, just, I know what you felt like, you know. I mean, I just couldn't. When I saw him laying there, and I reached over and... He's cold and he's hard. I thought, my, this guy, he's really dead. <laughs> he's dead all right. But I'm sure the Lord was sitting there, well, son, well, do something. I can just see now if he'd have just given me that faith, I could have reached over and grabbed him by the neck and said, Jack, wake up in the name of Jesus. I rebuke that spirit of death like I did to the other guy. And the other guy come back to life. But that was something. That was really something. But, you know, everybody in that home where I spoke over that man, and God raised him from the dead. Everybody there, including the man himself, which is still alive today. That's been 15 years ago. That guy is still alive. He still does not believe that I raised him from the dead in the name of Jesus. It just was a coincidence sermon. We don't believe. I mean, his whole family. Yet the, the, his son-in-law was a paramedic that was there. And his son-in-law one called me on the phone and said, Thurman, we've lost him. About 30 minutes ago, he would have no uh, pulse or nothing. He's dead. And I said, well, let's pray. He said, Thurman, it's too late to pray he's dead. We haven't had a heartbeat or a pulse in the 30 minutes. I said, it ain't never too late to pray. So I said, death, I rebuke you. And that was, I know that was the Lord. Death, I rebuke you. I command the spirit of life back in you. And he said, my God, we just got a heartbeat. He got a pulse. I, I, I said, what are you going to do? And he said, I'm going to take him to Irving to the hospital. I said, okay, I'll get up and come down there. So it took me a while to drive to Irving. But anyway, I went to the hospital and walked in there about 5 o'clock in the morning when I got there, 4.30 or 5. I walked up to a doctor, and I said, sir, is Mr. Jackson in here somewhere? He said, yeah, he's down in room 13. I said, how's he doing? He said, well, he said, he's alive. He said, 
he'd have been better off if he stayed dead. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, he, the paramedics say he had, they had no heartbeat or no pulse for about a half hour. So I said, he'll be a vegetable. He won't be able to do anything. I said, Doc, do you see those hands? Yes. I said, Jesus said, lay those hands on the sick and they'll recover. He didn't say they'd be a vegetable. No and that's when he said, oh, my God, what have I got here? What have I got here? So I go down there in the room, you know, where he's at, and he's sleeping. So I go down there, and I just lay my hands on him. Did Jesus say to lay hands on the sick? And they will recover. So I just went in and laid my hands on him and said, Lord, he's yours. It's yours. I've done everything you told me to do. And within two weeks, that guy's back at work, and, and he retired and a few years later. And he, and he worked for me. He was a good worker. And he's still alive today. I was over in the tax office the other day going in to get a license plate change, and there he stood in the line. I stood in the line with him for an hour, talked to him, everything. He never mentioned one time about being raised from the dead. Never. He didn't even mention it. He, Oh, yeah, he's a good Christian. He's Church of Christ. Boy, I mean, he's, re he's good Christian. Yeah. He's a good Church of Christ. I guarantee. And the Church of Christ that's over here in whatever, and this one up here on top of the hill, they're talking about joining together, and he's a member of that church. January 1st. Oh, January 1st, they're going to join together? So you might get to meet him. Yeah. yeah, Mr. Jackson. So you all will have to look for him. And someday, you know, I'll sit down with him and talk to him again and see if he is going to believe, you know. But, you know, it, it, when, you're, when, been, when you've been raised in a church your whole life, and like me, me like I was in a Baptist church or like he was in a church of Christ or a Catholic church or whatever, you never see any miracles. Is that true? I, mean, I, mean, I was in a Baptist church years and years and years. I never saw an answer to prayer. You know, I never reached over and laid hands on somebody and, in a, in a place of business and said, you're healed. Or somebody said, I got a headache. I said, you want to get rid of it? Well, yeah. I said, be healed and touch them in the name of Jesus, and it's gone. But I've done that many times since I've learned the principles of the kingdom. And it works every time. Isn't that amazing? <clears throat> Miss Carrie never had the faith to go raise somebody from the dead either, but she did that same thing. <laughs> They're in hospice. They're nearly dead. Yeah, right. It's nearly over, girl. But you prayed, you prayed, and the Lord raised them up, see? That, does that, that means he doesn't care if it's a female or a male, right? right? You're a woman, and you're his daughter, and you went and did what he said, and he raised that girl up. Amen. And that's just awesome. Yes. What do we need to do, folks? We need to praise him more, don't you think? Yes. As you go home today, Lord. In fact, I'd, I'd, for, for the last minute here, I'd just like everybody to raise your hand. If you want to stand up, you could even stand up. But I want you just to praise the Master. He is the King. He's the Lord. Father, we praise you. We thank you for all the wonderful things you do around here. Lord, you're so great. You're our God and our Lord and our Savior and our healer and our deliverer, our provider. You are everything, and we love you, and we praise you, and we thank you, and we worship you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for taking the Cheryl's Bridge off of that tooth that day, Lord. I thank you for all. I thank you for our healing. I thank you for everything you do, Lord, every day. And I praise you for opening our eyes to the things of God. I thank you for the Word of God that you've given us to read and study so we can learn about you. Lord, we just praise you and thank you and worship you for being the King of kings and Lord of lords and God of gods. Thank you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen.